Thank you for tuning into White Centipede Noise Podcast. Please hit the like button and subscribe to this channel. This podcast is made possible by viewer and listener support. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting it at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. White Centipede Noise is a label and mail order based in Germany, releasing top quality noise on tape, CD, and vinyl. White Centipede Noise is also the premier EU-based distributor of international noise. Visit whitecentipedenoise.com to see available label releases and weekly distro updates. Welcome to White Sandy Noise Podcast. Today, my guest is a legend of Midwestern noise. Some would say the goat. Please welcome Wyatt Howland of Skingraft. Good, Good morning. morning, Wyatt. Good morning, Oscar. How you doing, man? Doing great. It's really Saturday. Good to see you. Saturday morning in family life, right? Uh huh. Yep. Saturday morning. Kids are here. Tomorrow's Laurie's birthday. Wow. It's going to be a cool weekend. Cool. You said kids. Does that mean multiple? Yeah. I got two kids from a previous marriage and uh, then a four month old with Laurie. Cool. I knew about yeah. the, I, I, that's, that's great. So you got a full house. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the new baby. And, uh, that's, that's super awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, jumping into your non-family activities, um, skin graft, as far as I know, started around 2006. Is that correct? Um, that was the first release that I made public. Yeah. I started in 2003. Okay. It was a two-piece band for the first year. Okay. And was it also like harsh noise? It started off, or uh, it was guitar and drums, mm -hmm. more like it was instrumental stuff. But um, when I I was down in Canton, Ohio at the time, and me and the drummer split ways and. Uh, when I moved, then I moved to Cleveland, two thousand four, and it became the Electronic Project. Okay, cool. And then, so that was active, like live, for a while before recording. Is that how it worked out? I I did a few uh, CDs between two thousand four and two thousand six, and I started playing live in two thousand six. Okay, so that was in Cleveland, right? But yeah. That was also a big time, like the, the mid 2000s, where there's a lot of activity in Michigan and general Midwestern area. What was the what was the Cleveland, Ohio, Michigan connection at that time? Oh, that was an exciting time for that. 2006 was when Cleveland and Michigan joined forces, you know. Yeah. Um, there was it was kind of creeping together for a while but that's when it happened yeah and that's i mean the midwest in general particularly those two states are pretty sprawling oh yeah huge like space wise i mean it's not like two neighboring cities that can just you know people can hop on a bus or hop in the car and hang out how did that work out with so many kind of different points around, you know, Michigan, first of all, and also Ohio. How did that that collaboration work out? Was there a lot of, like, long-term traveling to shows and, like, staying for weeks at a time or something like that? It was, well, the way they do it out in Michigan was all these guys, they they all live in different cities, so they're all used to driving, like, hours to these gigs. Yeah. 
And um, same with Ohio, really. You know, you got guys coming up from Columbus, which is uh, a couple hours south. Um, you have people coming in from Akron. Yeah. Toledo was, uh, we were trying to make Toledo kind of, uh, kind of like a halfway point, mm-hmm. but, um, that was kind of hard to get it together. There were a couple of venues. There were some really killer shows in Toledo mm. actually. And so there was kind of like an active organization to try to make this, this work. I mean, how does that work? For example, if you drive three hours, four hours for a show, the show rages. I assume people are getting, you know, fucked up. Are they like then crashing somewhere and spending like a day or two or, or is it like people going home? Like after the show, like, okay, see you guys. Like we're heading home. A little bit of both. Okay. What would you say defined Midwestern noise at that time? Cause that term gets thrown out around a lot. Midwestern noise. And it can mean a lot of different things, but I mean, I think for a lot of people, they think of, you know, Michigan, they think of Hanson, American tapes, they think of you, they think of a certain atmosphere and vibe, but what, what is it in your mind? What, what sets it apart from other geographic areas? Um, well, the instrumentation for one thing, it seemed like a lot of people were making music out of really crude instruments, like just stuff they'd get at thrift stores and um, just really trashy, it was like a real trashy aesthetic. Yeah. And um, real home homemade stuff, you know. Every, it was like a real... It was like a real underground DIY kind of basement culture, cassette culture. Right. Gross, like dirty, dirty stuff. Yeah. What's Cleveland like compared to some other cities we might be familiar with? How would would it compare to, you know, Columbus or? It's, It's like, it's really industrial here. There are some really gross, uh, st- big, huge steel factories, you know, mm-hmm. and um, it's pretty poor. Uh, it's real cheap to live here, mm-hmm. but it's really, um, and there are some really beautiful parts. There's a lot. We have this uh, park system that kind of goes through the whole city that's really killer, but it's surrounded by just really dirty uh city Mm -hmm. are those like are they fairly dangerous to hang out in the parks um i've never had any trouble yeah okay this episode of white centipede noise podcast is brought to you by oxen records now available on oxen records neural the decisive moment cd scum and unsustainable social condition Necessary Downfall CD, Systemic Sewage and Unsustainable Social Condition, All Available Weaponry CD, Title Still Available, Circuit Wound, A Sudden Lapse of Concentration, Scathing, A Capital Beneath the Waves, and Leah P, Surviving the Familiar. Available soon internationally from White Centipede Noise or from the label at oxenrecords.bigcartel.com. A lot of the Midwestern vibe, you know, it's it's very diverse, but a lot of it from that era is kind of like... You know, you you mentioned this this handmade DIY kind of feel. A lot of it has kind of a more uh, I don't want to say humorous, but psychedelic kind of absurdist aesthetic and approach. Whereas your sound is really really grim and has been basically the entire time. I mean, maybe a little bit of black humor thrown in there, but it's pretty it's pretty serious and, and, and grim in comparison to some of the other typical Midwestern noise artists. Why did you take that approach to it? And how did, how did that relate to your other peers and colleagues and friends at the time? I've always liked really dark uh, art and, you know, I really appreciated just, um, 
cold, dark, like large black structures and textures. And I've always mm -hmm. been drawn the um, you know, like big black paintings and dark movies and cold industrial music and stuff, you know. In the scene at that time, in 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 the the environment, was there a lot of destructive behavior going on? Was there like dark shit going on within within the scene? Do you think? Did you feel that way? Um, in the scene, I guess yeah. There's always been for pretty gross destructive behavior and. You know, these underground music scenes. It's pretty gnarly. Uh, I'm glad to step away from that. I was yeah. really glad the uh, pandemic to hit. You know what I mean? <laughs> was it going up until that time that it kind of... The pandemic allowed a kind of a break from it to distance yourself from it? For me, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, but you know, you're, you're still rocking hard. Like you've still been repping harsh noise and kind of doing your thing pretty consistently throughout this time. I mean, I think you've probably had waves of more and less activity, but you've been pretty, you've holding, been holding it down pretty, pretty consistently. Whereas a lot of other artists from kind of those mid 2000 times have, have disappeared from at least the noise scene. Not to say that they've just dropped off, but they've either been doing other things or or people have kind of lost contact with them. Why do you think that is? Why have you had the endurance and the and the and the staying power and and desire to continue on, whereas other people have seemingly kind of moved on or or fallen off? Well, it's everything I've been doing is part of the same project and I feel like it's not done yet. You know, mm. I've been getting closer, but I, there's still a lot more work to do. As for other people, you know, they get families and jobs and stuff that I don't know. I always, it's always kind of a drag when I see people dropping off. Yeah. Because I don't see how anyone could stop. I've tried to stop before yeah. <clears throat> when I thought that it was like, um, I thought that it was part of a destructive pattern, self-destructive pattern doing this stuff. Mm. So I tried stopping for a minute, but um, I can't stop. It's, you know, it's too good. Yeah. I love it. What is it you're wanting to achieve with skin graft? What is the, the driving force behind skin graft? There's, all right, well, there's an album that I want to make that I haven't made yet. Okay. And, but I'm close, you know. Close to finishing it or close to, be, like, starting it? I'm close to, every time I make something, I think that I'm making it, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then it satisfies me for a while, like the last one I made satisfied me for a couple of years i was like well maybe that's it maybe you know i'm good now yeah but then you know you get the drive to make a new one because then the old the old music doesn't do it for you anymore you know do you think you can ever really do that do you think that's a an attainable goal i'm kind of hoping not you know <laughs> they like doing it too much yeah um, who have been some of the key individuals in terms of influence or collaboration or importance in the development of your project and just, just your activities you know yeah um well, the guy that um, the guy that really got me moving 
was this dude Ryan Keene here in Cleveland. He's got a project called Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. And he, mm -hmm. he's in a band with me called DPI. And uh, that guy, I had been looking for this stuff. Like, I didn't know where where to find this stuff, you know. I've been looking, and he was, I met this dude at a gig. Um, actually, my sister introduced me to him. She's like, yo, you got to meet this guy. And he was like, yo, you got to check out, like, you know, Mersbau haters, you know. And there's a Thuun, New Block haters, non-White House, all mm -hmm. that, you know. And he would come over to my apartment, and he had a he had a CD burner. This is before, like, internet was everywhere. I mean, internet was here, but, you know. Right. It was the same. And he would bring over a CD burner and big stack CDs. He'd be like, yo, here's... Uh, Russell Haswell, that was the that was the big one for me. Russell mm -hmm. Haswell, Live Salvage. When I heard that one, I was like, it clicked, you know. Yeah. So that was fucking that was killer. And um, meeting people after that, meeting like um, dudes like B Mask, dudes from Emeralds, Tusco Terror guys, Dillaway, um, and Mike Colino comes in. He was he was a real important guy in my life, uh, mm -hmm. brother. And, um, but then dudes like Luke Tandy and, uh, you know, Pat Yankee, you and, um, yep. Sam, when you guys came to Cleveland, that was right. like, that was a real important gig for me mm -hmm. that no one went to, you know, dude, that was crazy. <laughs> that you was crazy. <laughs> You you opened the show and we I had I had bought a really crappy but pretty loud PA for that tour and I think I even got the tweet like when I bought it it was like this is a decent PA but you got to get the tweeters repaired so I paid paid some money at the tweeters repaired <laughs> like you opened that gig and I think you played like a two minute set and there was the the high end was so intense and you you melted the tweeters <laughs> oh no really <laughs> yeah but it was it was awesome it was worth it I was stoked I was super stoked. <laughs> And it still it still worked for the rest of the the the, the tour. It didn't really matter at all. Nice, that's cool. But that was a great show. I mean, I, I I remember that night at also at your place. You know, we were just out on the porch, and I think I had just kind of like made contact with you, or just kind of we weren't really in touch before then. But I think like Luke and Luke and Pat were already pretty close with you in terms of like trading and 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 and. and correspondence and pat was really 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 adamant that you like come on the rest of the tour with us right I should. And, <laughs> and i remember you were like dude i'm work. i gotta work it like every day this week and he spent like two hours like drinking beers on your porch just being like dude come I and you got really pissed and i think you tackled him like really hard you fucking knocked him you knocked him to the ground after after a while oh really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He, he he he'll remember luke remembers it he was like he was like at, po at some point he was like pissing you off because he just kept 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 trying to <laughs> trying to get you to come on tour like tomorrow <laughs> damn i wish i would have yeah i was working at pizza yeah. hut yeah that's right i mean come on <laughs> <laughs> yeah but got to pay rent. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, I don't like to dwell on gear too much. And I don't, I also don't like to like get people to give their, their techniques away, but um, I'm also curious. Can you tell me like maybe what a couple of the key skin graft pieces of gear are? Cause you have a very unique sound, but I have a sense that you're not really like, a gear buff that's always buying new things and you know tweaking your sound i feel like you is that accurate like you've kind of you've got your setup and it's kind of like your your calling card right yeah it's um i've had the same kind of system going on for the past uh you know while man um I use um, 
like I do like to get new stuff, but I end up just always using the old stuff. Yeah. I got, um, so basically what I use in skin graft is feedback loops and cassette tape and the feedback loops, um, pedal loops, you know, mm -hmm. a multi effects box in a loop. And that's like 75% of my sound, you know? Sure. And then I got, uh, tape machines running field recordings. Mm -hmm. And that's like the other 25%. But I also jam, um, sure. like junk metal. I've been trying to like record a lot of junk metal and slow down the tape, you know, blow it out. Yeah. Yeah. How, how is that working with, with feedback loops? Because like, that's something that I feel like is a really hard thing to use in a way that's functional for harsh noise. It's it's kind of like the, one of the first things a lot of noise artists discover because it's like this really chaotic thing that you can just kind of do with basically any piece of gear. But a lot of people get these really annoying chirping sounds <laughs> out of them, which I which I like for me are instantly like a a turn off like that's that screams right away like no this is like amateur noise or something like that but you know your sound doesn't have any of that how do you do you ever have it do you ever have like challenges controlling those feedback loops to do what you want and and avoid certain things that you don't want oh yeah um there's a lot of stuff that gets edited out you know yeah but um I'm I'm not very adventurous with the feedback loop, so like I found a few settings that I find really useful that I've been using like forever. Yeah. Is it true that feedback loops also damage gear? Um I've never seen any evidence of that. Um Actually, downstairs, Laurie has been working on these feedback loops of her own, and she's got, like, it's insane. She's got, like, three mixers hooked up to, like, three graphic equalizers all in a loop, and it sounds so insane. But um, I've never heard, I've never fried any mixers or anything Okay. from that. Fried them from using the wrong power supply, but... Right. Yeah. What about, do you think, do you think like the sound of the electronics themselves have like changed over time? You know, like just from the, like that the circuits have been maybe warmed up or, or changed through the, the electricity running through them. Do you think that's, that's happened? Do you think it's a possibility? That's yeah. I think that is possible. It's like it's so mysterious to me, you know. But it sure it yeah. sure seems that way to me. Yeah. But like you can really uh, season in these fried electronics. Yeah, exactly. I feel like that's that's what I I can imagine that it's like a seasoned pan or something like that, like, right. like something like a like a like a, a baseball glove you break in that if you got a new muff or a new four track or something like that and and tried your your setup i imagine it probably wouldn't react the same yeah it's true i um i was using the same rig for years and then i and then i wanted one i wanted to duplicate it for tour right so i could leave my studio mm -hmm. stuff at home and have my tour stuff that i you know so i could just throw it around and not have to worry about breaking it and um yeah yeah, I bought the same gear and not the same results at all. Great. But then after years of using them, just kind of getting used to the getting used to the new stuff, they started breaking in, you know. Cool. Yeah. Far out. <laughs> it's weird, I don't know. Um Yeah, I that's that's that totally makes sense, but that that's cool. That confirms 
my my belief that you actually put it to the test like that, A B. Um what function does doing noise have for you personally? Not necessarily just performing a recording, but just just the act of doing it. Like what is that why do you do it simply? Like what's what does it do for you? It's uh, it's a cathartic move, you know. And um it's all it just really satisfies the urge to create stuff. It's um I I've, I've always had uh trouble communicating, I felt like, you know, so and I felt mm. like this is a way that I can communicate in an untraditional sense. You know. Mm-hmm. Do you put a lot of like post production or or thought or nitpicking to something after you've recorded it before you release it? Usually like do you go back and listen to it and go, ah, that's you know, I, I should should be change it like this or that, or is it kind of like a an expression that more or less comes out from the moment? I I do nitpick a bit on stuff. Uh, sometimes though not so much, you know. Some stuff just gets uh, made really easily. Some stuff takes mm-hmm. forever, you know. What is more important for you, uh, listening to noise or making it? Um, I suppose listening to it, you know. Yeah. Really? You get more from listening to noise than than making your own? I mean, you know, you got to have both, you know. For sure. Hey, everyone. Um, Just want to let you know about WCN TV. It's basically an in-depth platform for all sorts of various noise content. There's a series called After Blast where I do follow-up episodes with people who have already been on the show. Um, there's a series called Noise on the Run, which is basically me just ranting about you know, various noise topics, my personal take on things, uh, a lot of other things in the works. So check it out. It's available for Patreon supporters at five euros a month, and you get a ton of exclusive content. It airs now every other week, and the podcast airs on the alternating week. So the podcast comes twice a month and WCN TV content comes in the alternating weeks. So check it out at uh, patreon.com slash white setup noise. Let me know what you think. Write me if you have any suggestions or ideas and uh, thanks for your support. Are you satisfied seeing harsh noise as kind of like a traditional genre? Cause like, a, I feel like in some ways harsh noise, even though it's, under the blanket of experimental music, it's like very kind of traditional. Like there are the kind of elements and instruments that most artists use, you know, uh, contact mics, distortion pedals, feedback loops, tapes, and there's kind of a certain sound and, and way that it's put together. Do you, are you, are you, are you happy with that? approach to it or do you have a do you have a desire to have harsh noise kind of evolve into something more or or push push the genre boundaries well i really i really enjoy watching harsh noise artists you know um and it does evolve but you know some things are classics for a reason you know like yeah um sometimes i think about new sounds like I know this guy, um, who's always like pushing for new sounds, but then um, you know they'll sound they'll sound crazy, but then a year later, it sounds yeah. like dated, you know. Right. Yeah. So. Um, for sure. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I think there's the. Yeah. I've been kind of here talking about on the podcast now and then like, oh, I'm curious to see what people can like, what younger artists can do with new 
sounds or new approaches to harsh noise, not like doing something different, but like harsh noise, but with new sounds. But I think actually what I want to see more of is not necessarily new, but just that artists are really listening, you know, and like really crafting something that is like very intentional and good simply. I mean, it doesn't have to be new, but like, you know, that people, people aren't just going for the traditional sounds that are easy and lazy and that they're not also just going for new sounds that are new and crazy. But, you know, it's, I think it's a good point about being dated because that's, that's, an, that's a really big issue. I think with a lot of, I think, progressive ideas in general that they don't really have, sometimes they don't have merit outside of the fact that they're new yeah, or different. Exactly. You know? Some sounds are just so classic, like the sounds of metal, you know, the sounds of crushing tapes and, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like, I feel like your sound is very, very, it's very, very specific. I mean, it is very classic, but it's also has a very identifiable, like this is skin graft sound but you know you're using those classic sounds metal junk you know blown out analog to storage shit what's your what's your um solo process of recording and and and, and working like you know you've kind of mentioned your your gear but what's your like when it comes to composition or intention how do you how do you approach a new recording? Well, lately I haven't had much time to just hang out in the studio, so I'll kind of I'll get my mind working. You know, I'll think about shit for a while before I sit, before I come up to the studio and record. Mm -hmm. Kind of plot it out, you know, plot out themes or uh, plot out sounds, the composition, and then. Lately, I've felt like a lot of clarity, and so it's been really easy to transfer shit from my mind into the into the disc. I remember when we visited you in Cleveland that one time. You had like your room, I think, was just like your shit was set up there at all times, and I think you mentioned that you just can plug in and play like yeah whenever um has that always been how you've worked and how often are you able how i mean i think a lot of us even if we have that ability a lot of us don't necessarily do it like how often were you really just kind of switching on the gear and and going there, in on it there have been periods of time where i would get to do that every day you know for extended periods of time uh right now it's only like it's not that often, maybe like a couple of times a month. So busy, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's really, if you're able to have your shit set up all the time and just be able to flip it on, that's the move. How does the, how does your working process when you're doing solo stuff, skin graft, uh, compare with collaborations? Cause you've been involved in a ton of collaborations. I actually found a, I'll, I'll put it up on the on the screen when I when I edit this. I found like a a page for you that I think automatically generated like your name and each one of the projects in like a Venn diagram kind of thing, and it had these these points connect them all. I probably like automatically generated from Discogs, I would guess. But it was this this crazy it's this crazy graph that shows you in the middle and, and your, your connections to all these different people and projects. How, how does the, the working process vary from when you're just, you know, working on your own to when you're going in with someone else? That sounds cool. Um, a lot of times, I mean, some people that I work with are, it'll just be like buddy projects, you know, like we're hanging out, we're having fun. We like each other's music, yeah. go in and see what happens. Sometimes there's more of a deliberate plot, you know, 
um, like when I was working with, uh, I work with Stephen Petrus sometimes and we'll, mm-hmm. we'll have a plot like, you know, you know, heaviest, heaviest thing ever, you know, will be the plan, something like that. Or, right. um, or like with, when I work with Roman, you know, it will just be like fucking kill Jibbers, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But sometimes it'll just be like, you know, meet up, plug in, see what happens. You know, I work with, I was working with David Russell a lot and uh, we would write songs together. He's, he's a really good songwriter. He would uh, map out, map out the tracks. Mm -hmm. And these days I mostly just work uh, with Laurie, my wife, and, um, that's amazing working with uh your partner like i've never had that experience before it's incredible yeah that's awesome do you ever are any of those collaborations uh like male collabs or studio collabs or they're usually in person sometimes yeah um let me think of which ones I, it's been a while since i've done a male male type collab generally in person yeah 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 because your your noise is definitely to me it sounds very much like played noise i think that's for me i guess thinking of it now that's kind of one of the characteristics i associate also with a lot of midwestern noise that it's like played live (laughs) not that there isn't some post-production or or multi-tracking but still that feel of like live electronics you know And that and that and that era also that that two thousand mid two thousands era spawned so many collaborations I suppose which really feel like you know people just kind of like getting together in the basement somewhere and plugging in and and jamming I think you know people people call people call all of that stuff jamming but I mean I, I I think that sometimes has a negative connotation but just this you know live playing with each other oh yeah basement <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you mentioned, you know, you have a baby now and you're looking really healthy. And uh, you mentioned the pandemic kind of being something that changed some things for you. What's, what are you up to these days and what's, what's changed in your life and, and what, what brought about those changes? All right. So. So, okay, I was an alcoholic for decades. Bad. Bad. Okay. And okay. I was trying to quit for years, and it was driving me crazy. I was like, what the, like I can't fucking quit. Why? And uh, yeah. I was went going to therapy. I was trying, like, medicines and stuff. And then I, yeah, I mentioned I was married before. My marriage fell apart. Um. And then, you know, so I'm on my own. I meet Laurie at a gig um, in Cleveland. And we start hanging out. She's like, she's like, yo, I'm you from the future. You know, I was you just a few months ago. And I had a stroke. And now I'm clean. And I'm going to the gym all the time. I don't drink. I don't smoke. None of that shit. And it's good. And I'm like all right like let's team up then wow pandemic hit music scene is over so like because it was the gigs that was dragging me down all the time you know what i mean and hanging out in basements with my friends sure hanging on in the basements with like a 30 pack every night so right that was incredible being being able to dry up you know get in shape get a yeah clean mind and now I got, I work at a record factory, right? This place I'd wanted to work at for years, but I was like, I, can, I can't work here because like, I would never be able to get to work on time. So now I got the job I want. I got, like, I got it going on. I got 
clean. Cool. Feeling good. And my noise is better than it was back then because I got clarity. That's cool. Wow. And thanks. Thanks, pandemic, oh, yeah, for you know, shutting down the fucking bars and, you know, <laughs> and keep away from my friends. Or, yeah. Like, I love them. They're great guys. But, I mean, I was the one dragging me down. But, you know, hanging out with them wasn't helping, you know. Right. Yeah. That's that's amazing. Do you, do you feel like now that things are opening back up again, you're ready to kind of reapproach the the scene on new on new terms yeah absolutely uh now that i'm feeling better i mean uh like we played a few gigs last year you know and coming back clean was like super cool yeah i can't really do much because uh because we got baby but yeah we are playing a gig in Richmond next in two weeks. That would be cool. This place called Crystal Palace. It's their last, it's their like going away show. They're moving out. So, okay. That would be cool playing a gig. Cool. Well, congratulations, man. You look really actually really healthy and really good. I wasn't sure what was the case, but I mean, I saw pictures of you like recently, I guess on Instagram or something like that after not seeing you for a while, I mean, we've saw, we met each other in person many, many years ago, but like, haven't really yeah. seen each other face to face in a long, long time. And I was like, damn dude's like looking really, looking really sharp. Like, Thank you. So that's, congratulations. I mean, that's, that's a good thing all around. And you know, the family, the baby, the, the, you know, the love, the, the whole thing. That's, that's a, sounds like a good package. And I do, yeah. And I, and I, and I'm really happy to hear that you're still rocking with skin graft because I think that's a, I think that's a misconception that some people have that, you know, music or art uh, is somehow, you know, improved by addiction or, or, negative headspace or you know negative events in life i think it's definitely not true yeah. <laughs> i think that was that's, definitely a conception of mine for years i was like i can't like i can't jam without this shit but right yeah cool kick ass um so i'm i i actually wanted to do a a, <laughs> a series and maybe i'll do it in the future of like talking to noise guys who have kids because i think this is a really interesting phenomenon combination and i a lot of my er, earlier guests in the podcast all had or were all dads and i didn't really bring it up like you know like uh ilka from from hari uh tommy eric newstrand from vms elite is now a dad and, and so forth and so on um but so i'm curious about how like i suppose you're do you, do you, do you jam noise and, and play noise around your, your, your child? Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, you're multiple children. I so, you know, you've, 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 I'm curious what, what, what kind of effect do you think that has? Because everyone pretty much discovers noise at some point later in their life as kind of a reaction to, I mean, it usually starts out as kind of like a punk rock subversive reaction to like, Oh, like this is this is like anti music, and then you know usually you realize it isn't anti music; it's actually music, and that's what you know fuels the the love for it. But it kind of starts as this kind of rebellion, almost from you know what we've been taught of as music. But what what do you think that's going to be like for a child to grow up with that? Is like no, this is music, like. How, how do how do how do they react to it? Like, are your are your other kids a bit older now? Uh huh. Yeah, twelve and six. Okay. And they've what's their what's their take on it? Um, my younger one loves it. You know, six year old loves it. Twelve year old. Yeah. You know, I've been playing it for her her whole life, and um, like she's she's used to it. She respects it. You know, she hears it at yeah. music. You know. It's it's yeah. like not what she likes to jam herself, you know. But um, yeah, 
but like when she hears it, she recognizes it as as music, and you know, it's cool. Like, that's very cool. Yeah. I said, but I, I I suppose that's like gonna be like the first generation of people that are gonna eventually grow up and you know be adults and be like, oh, my dad was a noise artist. You know, my my parent, my my mom was a noise artist. I grew up listening to noise. <laughs> Right, you know, in, in we're approaching that 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 time where I mean, a lot of the older the OGs, so to speak, that are maybe in their fifties or whatever now, already have children that are approaching that age. But I think in the coming years beyond this, I think there'll be even more people that grew up with this this context. I'm curious to see if those will, if you know, those kids will grow into noise artists or if they'll just reject it and be like, this is stupid. This is what my parents liked, you know? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. Like, Oh, I hate my parents. I'm going to jam some, uh, you know, <laughs> right. But man, we got, uh, it goes both ways. I mean, most, a lot of people don't hate their parents and a lot of people do end up digging what their parents put them onto, you know, like, you know, big time. I mean, that's not, that's not unusual that, you know, you have a, you have parents with a cool musical taste, and then you grow up with a good oh, musical yeah. taste. But at some point, you at some point you deviate from it. Well, there's uh, Total Mom. That's a child of noise. I don't know. It seems like everyone I ask who has older children, like once they reach the teenage years, I'm like, "What do your kids think about noise?" And they're like, "They hate it. They think it's stupid." I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> right. They oh, like son. Just well, What's that? He dropped. Dillaway's son dropped some noise shit. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also very logical and very possible. For sure, Dillaway's son. He'll do. I mean, even if he doesn't do noise like his dad, he'll do something cool. I'm sure. As he gets older. It's out. Do you know what it's called? Uh, shit, shit. I want, I want to say it's called. I don't, I don't remember. I'll check it out. I'll find it. Hey, what's this? The Rita Lake Depth Lurker Machine? Why? Oh my goodness, a cassette off of the Cruel Symphonies label? Wow, this is a really good reissue. I better buy one. <laughs> I have a question from Jim. Jim Harris. Oh shit, Jim. What's up? He uh wanted me to ask you murder. <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> what I'm saying, brother. <laughs> <laughs> um I I've, I've I've also been curious um your I think it was your label but it's the kind of a some letters I've uh, you've associated with your project and stuff. Oh, a lot of the years. S K S K. Uh, how do you pronounce that? What is that exactly? Like, what is that? Um, is that just an abbreviation for skin graft? It was, it was, it was short for skin graft. It was, um, I was in this band with my sister called SKSK or SKKSKK for uh -huh. like a very short amount of time. Okay. And um, there were, there was like another, oh, I wanted something that kind of sounded like Dostoyevsky, right? Uh-huh. I just read uh, this Dostoyevsky book. And I wanted something uh -huh. that kind of sounded like that. Just the word, the pronunciation. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> and how did you how did you pronounce it? S K S K. Yeah. Okay. 
you've been, you know, very busy lately and presumably less. Did you say you got a job at a at a record factory, like a like a vinyl pressing factory in Cleveland? Mm-hmm. What do you do there? I mold the plastic, I press the records. It's cool. It's fun. I've been training there. Like I was working in shipping with my brother-in-law, Mitch, cool. for about a year. And that was cool being, you know, being the last guy with the records, shipping them out. Yeah. And then four months ago, I switched to the to the presses. Cool. And that's been these machines. They're they're made in the fifties. Yeah. And they've been they've been squishing record like squishing records twenty four hours a day since the fifties. Wow. So they're like ancient and they're like rickety. I bet. They're rickety. They're spitting oil everywhere. It's wild. It's Damn. super cool. And there's this uh, there's this division called Wax Mage there at the factory, and they make these just crazy looking records. It's cool. It's I really enjoy it. Is that a plant that does uh, like smaller DIY pressings, or is it more for like larger? We do both. Mostly we do. Mostly we do small stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cool. We did like last year. We did like cocky SP. We cool. did death rows. We yeah. did uh, Bukowski. We did uh, hive mind. You know. Cool. There's cool stuff. Are they? I mean, are you guys having a big? crisis or delay with like vinyl production right now or with 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 material i know things are getting hairy everywhere and i mean i keep seeing you know they're keeping kind of warnings that oh like this material is no longer available and prices are gonna skyrocket and and there have been like some really big delays like for example with vinyl um but on the other hand i th feel like things have actually been pretty normal and i don't know like 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 Taylor Gettys from uh, Absurd Exposition got hit. He did like a like this Merzbell record recently, and it like was super fast. Whereas everyone else is waiting like twelve months. Like, what's what's going on there from your insider's perspective? If you have any, yeah. Well, for one thing, the world is running out of nickel, which is mm. going to cause problems in theory. You know, because the stampers are made out of nickel and they've tried making them out of different materials but apparently nothing sounds the same okay. so that that's a potential problem but um a lot of a lot of the delays that plants have is because of uh record store day you know right record store day is like gumming up the works so they say yeah also, there's only so many uh, machines in the world, and they're not really making. Yeah. They're not really making new ones. So, at where I work, it's about a 12 month wait for now. However, that's going to change soon because we're getting more people in, and uh, we're our team's growing, so things will be moving at a faster rate. Yeah. Do you think there ever is talk of? starting to build new machines and modernize them? Or is it just kind of like indefinitely work with the, the old shit and keep it, keep it up to speed? They, there is, I have heard talk of new machines. There is actually a plant. Uh, you might've heard of this Kunaki, right? This place you can order you can order a record at a time and they'll ship them within twenty four hours, but it's like what? thirty dollars. Yeah, it's this machine out in California. You can order. I've never heard of it. Is it, is, is it a lathe? Is it a lathe cutting machine? I don't know what it is. I don't know what's. It must be a lathe. It might you know it must be yeah that's mu it must be cutting it in real time like a lathe. It's got it's probably not the same process. On the website, it's like. This is a professional quality record, like in shrink wrap and like the jacket art and shit, like ships within 24 hours. Yeah. I don't know what's up with okay. it. Okay. 
Crazy. That's Weesh. interesting to look into. But I, yeah, I mean, I know there are some good ones. I mean, there's like a good one in Berlin that I've, you know, but they do, it's a different process. They don't, they don't do the, they don't press it like with a, with a stamper to vinyl. They're, they're literally using machine that cuts it onto the, the disc. And then that, go, that's what goes out. So it's like what Grant Richardson does with his, you know, he has a lathe machine too. He has like a little lab, label doing lathes, but it's just insanely time consuming because you can't mass produce them. You have to like, it's like dubbing tapes, but with like with a record right. and a ton more actors to, you know, dial in to make it sound right. So Grant's still doing that. That's cool. Uh, I guess he is. I mean, yeah, he got that machine and like I said, when I mean, like he told me when he got it, like the guy who gave it to him was like, "Don't let anyone you anyone know you have this because everyone is going to want you to make lathes, and it's like right. super, super time consuming and never worth it." Right. So he did his label for a little while, and I think he's kind of back. Last time I talked to him, you know, we talked on the podcast. He said he's he's uh, kind of trying to get it up and running again, take a more like more focused approach to doing it. But yeah, he does. He, he has it for sure. It's, it's sick. That's killer. But yeah, that's awesome. You have a, that's a privileged position to be in like working in a vinyl factory, like as a, as a dude in like underground DIY music to actually be able to, you know, even if it doesn't have any like direct use for you, just that knowledge and that, that contact with that whole, process and industry is is great i mean it's super valuable just you know you can just spread your information within like the small noise underground just this just that those few details you've given like a man inside on the other side of the walls right that's, yeah that's that's huge because there's it's such a it's such an opaque process for for a lot of people i mean i think a lot of the audio reproduction stuff that goes on i mean like even with cassettes, you know, there's rumors, oh, like there's no chrome tape anymore or, you know, like blah, blah, blah. No one really knows what's going on. And these factories kind of don't really give clear information about it. So, I mean, just the fact that you're in <laughs> on the inside and have direct information is, yeah, it's valuable for sure. <laughs> what What would you say are your top five noise records of all time? Oh, shit. Top five noise. Okay. <laughs> Damn. All right. Well, we got a newcomer, right? The The most recent thing I purchased was uh, the reissue of Texas Chainsaw Dope Fiend, right? Yeah. Man. Yeah. I... I'd never heard it before. And like I was jamming it in the car and it's so intense, man. It just keeps ramping up. Yeah. And like, yeah. Like it's it, the composition's so good. It just goes from like, it just gets harder and harder and harder. Yeah. I was jamming it in the car and, um, I got a truck and I was on the highway and it was like side B. Right. And it's starting to fucking like hammer in. And my tire blew out and my brakes went oh. out, dude. And I'm going like 75 dude. miles an hour down the highway. No brakes. Texas Chainsaw Dope. <laughs> you know? This is so intense. <laughs> Great. It saved your life probably. Yeah, exactly. But, um, let's see what else. You know, uh, There are certain things that, like, there are certain tapes that just really, like, stick with, stuck with me. Like, this is Being Tape, Battery Cage 2. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hell um, yeah. Let's see. I don't know. It's probably, like, um, oh, Evenings, Descending Coma. That was a big one for mm -hmm. me. Um, mm -hmm. Knives, seven inch. Forges and uh, yep. cherry point. Um, yep. 
Hell yeah. Venereology. Okay. Remember about venereology? Yep. Um, Therita. Uh, fuck. Bodies bear traces of carnal violence. Yeah. Mania ultra negative. Right? Yep. I know that's more than five, but... I think it's six now, but that's all right. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to slow you down. Um, <laughs> dude, probably. Oh. Fuck, what's it called? Dog Lady. Folk of the Old Flood and Loud Doom. That album. Mm. Cool. Probably something by Plague Mother, you know. Mm-hmm. Paranoid Time Pinched Sack. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that. Dude, it's it, like anything on Tronics, yeah. you know? Anything on Tronics. Back rack. Yeah, that is essential stuff, truly. Okay, so that's 10. So that's 10. So we'll, I think it's, we'll cut it off there. Um, can you tell me five things of the past? I mean, I don't know how much new noise you're buying and listening to, but can you tell me five things? of the past year or two kind of that, that you're really, really into that aren't reissues. Dude, to be quite honest with you, like I wish that I knew what the fuck was going on in the world. Yeah. I've have my head up my, I, have, I live under a rock, you could say. Right. Sure. But like, so in my house, I, we, we each have recording studios. Yeah. And I'll hang out while Laurie's recording her shit. And like, I listen to her noise live yeah. through the speaker. And it's just, that shit is so good. Cool. So like her shit. Yohimbe, shit, right? You pronounce, it's, 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 you, stay, yeah. you, you pronounce Yohimbe? Uh-huh. Okay, cool. So Yohimbe is number one. She's number one. Yeah. And, uh, and me. Yeah. So. These dudes at work, they, uh, one of them comes up to me. He's like, Hey dude, um, I'm not going to be in tomorrow. I'm going to a noise gig. And I'm like, Oh no shit. Like, what are you going, what are you going to go see? And he tells me some band I'd never heard of. And, uh, I'm like, right on. Next day I see him. I'm like, or next time I see him, I'm like, yo, how was that gig? He goes, Oh dude, it was amazing. It was, it was sold out. Long sold out. People were trying to get in. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, he's like, oh yeah, everyone was moshing. I'm like, where where was this gig? He's like, oh, it's at this, uh, it's at this bar. I'm like, that wasn't a noise gig, man. And then this this other dude that was there, he's like, oh no, Wyatt, you don't understand. That was a harsh noise gig. And I'm like, there's no there's no way. That your noise gig was sold out. There's no way that your that people were moshing at your noise gig. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That wasn't a noise gig. Yeah. But, so maybe that's what's going on the past couple of years. I have no idea. But okay, so, so you, you didn't find out. you didn't find out who it was? I did find out who it was, but I I don't know who the hell it is. But they called it harsh noise. Yeah. Are they aware of who you are, or are you just Wyatt? There? No, they don't know who I am. They, uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, it, I make noise. In fact, they're like, oh, um, whatever. They're like, oh, you make like <laughs> experimental music. I was like, bye, brother. Uh, you know, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> Fuck, dude. They're disrespecting their OGs. They're like. <laughs> <laughs> and you're you're trying to get the drop on like where the noise gigs are from the young kids. <laughs> <They're> like, oh, <laughs> shit. Well, that's what I want to know about. I mean, I mean, that's what I want to know about for real. Like, I really am curious about what that is. I bet it's like death grips or something like that. And you you got to let them know. You got to. I mean, well, I don't know. I guess that's kind of kids are kids are dicks. I mean, if if like you try to be like, hey. What's up, young bulls? I'm. 
<laughs> Some call me the goat of harsh noise. Like, <laughs> I've been doing this since 2006. They might be like, yeah, right, whatever. That's fucking lame, dude. You're like grandpa. <laughs> Jesus. That's crazy, though. But, I mean, they, I, like I said, I mean, they, that must be like... Maybe it's like... Ghosty Mane or whatever, like some distorted rap or something like that. You know, I don't know. Right. I I want to know. Yeah, fi- you find out seriously. Find out. That's that would be great to great to know. There's some sold out noise shows that we don't know anything about. That's so weird. So mysterious. I'll cool. figure it out. I'll let you know. I'll keep you updated. Yeah. Cool. Cool, man. Well, um, what do you have going on, like, new or, or coming up? I know you're very, very busy. You know, you got family stuff to focus on, and you mentioned, you know, you have a an album coming out very soon on White Centipede Noise, which I'm very grateful that we work together on that. Um, but what's what's going on beyond that? What do you what do you have planned, and what's what's the plan for making the unattainable skin graft album the point it's in it's happening the next one's happening i got uh after i finished yours um like whenever i finish something it's it's always such a relief you know yeah like oh now i can make something now i can make a new album you know yeah this music's done yeah so I've got a few tracks recorded now that sound really good to my ears. And we're going to see what happens with that. Cool. All right. But I'm stoked to get that White Centipede CD out. Yeah, hopefully maybe by the time this airs, it'll be at least on the way. So That's killer. Check that out. Bad Final Judgment. Bad. Badass what? Oh, yeah, Patch? Badass batch of CDs. Batch, yeah, yeah. That'll be a good batch for sure. I'm mm-hmm. excited about that for sure. That's a... Yeah. That came together. That's coming together really nice. Heavy. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right, man. Well, give my best to your family. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. You too. Thanks a ton for taking the time to talk with me. It was good to, good to see you and good to hear you're doing really well. Take care. See ya. Thanks again for tuning into White Sampy Noise Podcast. Head over to the Patreon for more, including private episodes of Noise on the Run, exclusive photos, video, and audio related to the show, and discounts at the White Sampy Noise mail order. Your support is extremely appreciated and vital to keep the show going.